Hi, I'm Tony Russo, and this is Funeral Service Insider from Kate's Boylston. Each episode features conversations about emerging trends and news that affect the death care industry. We talk to people who understand the delicate balance of change in a profession and vocation steeped in tradition. This week, we're speaking with Jennifer Wright Berryman. She's an associate professor of social work at the University of Cincinnati, but she had been a suicidologist for about a decade before she started looking into death care. Her work with sexual minorities and suicide led her to look into how the death care industry dealt with sexual minorities, both in and outside of the industry. And she's come up with all sorts of interesting insights that I can't wait to share with you. I met Jennifer on Twitter when I was researching a story into how funeral homes could make their websites more LGBTQ plus friendly. And from there, I've actually referred her a couple of times just for questions, background information. She knows so much and she cares a whole lot about the issue. What's really interesting is that her research kind of upends a lot of the prejudices we all have about LGBTQ plus people and the funeral industry. And we'll get started with that in just a second. I just want to remind you to please stay on after the show for the postmortem where I'll share one of my favorite stories of the week in funeral service news. Um, But with no further ado, here is Jennifer Wright Berryman. One of the first things that I wanted to talk about was your entry into the um, LGBTQ aspect of death care, because that's not where you started. You started as a, and I guess primarily are a suicidologist, looking at how suicide affected people. Yeah. So um, because sexual and gender minorities um, or the LGBTQIA population is at higher risk for suicide. Um, That's always been, you know, a topic that a lot of us in this field of studying suicide and how to prevent it are focused. We focus on, on groups where the suicide rates are higher and how we can use programs and policies and support systems to manage that. How I sort of not transitioned, but also, but also incorporated, you know, studying death care into this area of research is I was at a conference probably six or seven years ago, and I overheard a conversation between colleagues talking about the lack of death education in our field. And it really struck me as curious because um, around that same time, I was getting calls from pastors and celebrants and funeral directors and other folks in the death care world sort of asking me for guidance on how to provide a proper, you know, funeral or ceremony or memorial for someone who had died by suicide. And in tandem, you know, someone who had died by suicide who was in the LGBTQ community. So I started thinking that if I don't know enough about what their needs are, they may not know enough about what the needs of someone who, you know, is is in that LGBTQ community. And, and sort of the topics sort of married themselves for me there. And for the first few years, I was just doing a lot of reading and trying to understand, you know, the aspects of providing death care services, the whole trajectory from someone starting to think about death in a way that they need to prepare, you know, pre-planning all the way to, you know, end of life care, someone dying, body disposition and, and sort of everything in between. So I just read and read and read and just started having informal conversations with folks to increase my understanding and awareness of where things were. And what I realized was during this whole time, all this reading I was doing, there were very few voices directly from the LGBTQ community involved in these conversations. And what I found was really interesting was that there are a number, uh, numerous folks from the LGBTQ community that work in death care um, and various aspects of death care, and yet I wasn't hearing their voices and I wondered where they were. So uh, I started down that path from both the consumer side. So if I was an LGBTQ Mm -hmm. person looking for death care services, or if, you know, if I was to learn more about being a provider and being inside, you know, inside that world, um, what, what do those things look like? So that's when I started to develop my research questions and my concepts and, and kind of started down the road of, of studying it very intentionally a couple of years ago. Now, 
was it was it just as simple as that people that were um, in the sexual minority didn't want to be advocates and funeral directors? They just they just wanted to do their, their job and they didn't want to have to also take on the the, the burden of, of being advocates. Or was it just that they didn't have the opportunity? Like, what, what did you discover that disconnect was? Yeah, I mean, I think all of those things are in some ways sort of right. So I've had the absolute fortune um, in the last year to do a ton of formal interviews in my research with people both inside and outside of the death care space, um, including recently a conversation with someone uh, who is inside the SCI Unite group, which is a formal group that operates with the SCI funeral homes. Uh, that is um, a group that works toward equality for LGBTQ folks, and they look at policies and, and so forth. And I think that, yes, there are a lot of LGBTQ people who don't want to, um, they, they want to go to work and they want to do their job and they want to serve people and they want to be in service to people and they don't necessarily want to you know, spend a lot of time calling out, if you will, some of the behaviors or right. some of the concerns. And then there are folks who are very activated and very involved and, very, and, and do have voices. I think the reason why it's difficult to find those voices sometimes is you have to know where to look. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, there's not a lot of access points where people gather. So, you know, NFDA tends to have now a group that meets informally. Um, maybe they have dinner or, or time together. I've talked to some folks about that. Um, SCI Unite is a group that's for, that formally is bonded over trying to achieve uh, an equal workspace for folks um, who are sexual and gender minorities. So there are access points that now, after doing this for a couple of years, I've gained some I've gained an audience with some folks who are some key voices in the field and who have given me access. So, so it just takes time and connection to find the voices. But I think you're sort of right on all those points. You know, some folks, they just, they don't want to be the voice of the gay or, or the, or the trans or the queer person, you know, working in the death care industry. They want to be who they are and do their job and, you know, a citizen. <laughs> and then there, and then there are others who, you know, certainly have um, their sights set on, on making the death care space a, a more equitable place to work for, for folks. So. Um, we talked about your research had three parts. Can you, can you talk about like what your, what your big picture plans are and, and how you've kind of come along in, in, in bits and pieces? Yeah. Yeah. So the first part was I randomly selected funeral home websites from all across the United States uh, and tried to identify where the um, sort of inclusive language and graphics and forms and really any signaling that a funeral home would be a safe space for an LGBTQIA person on their website. And so, um, you know, my my hypothesis going into that first study was that in more sort of politically liberal areas, if you will, that I would find maybe some some signaling on some websites like a pride flag or, you know, a lot of funeral home websites have sort of community pages where they talk about how they're involved in their communities. I thought I might see someone at pride, like a pride festival picture or something like that. And across almost 100 websites across the United States, which I realize is a small sample size, given that there are 18,000 plus funeral homes, I found zero, any, I found none. I found no, no indications explicit or otherwise that that particular funeral home was designating themselves openly uh, as an inclusive provider for LGBTQ people. So that was surprising. The second part of the study was to evaluate how policy both at the federal and at the state levels, um, lent itself to the public accommodations for LGBTQ people. And then I looked at policies laid out by the NFDA and, and 
you know, SCI Corporation because individual funeral homes, family-owned individual funeral homes don't necessarily have explicit policies. So I looked at SCI and NFDA, which both explicitly talk about that providers will not, shall not discriminate based on sexual orientation or gender identity. That is part of also my third research, third arm, I guess, of the research is to talk to providers who are LGBTQI folks in the death care space to see, you know, do these policies actually hold water? Do, do funeral homes feel like they have a standard to uphold all the various rights that come with being a citizen, but being a gay or trans or queer citizen? I get very, I've gotten varied answers. So, you know, it's like, yeah, these policies are made in good faith, but we don't know whether or not they would be upheld. We don't know if the NFDA or SCI would actually, you know, sanction a funeral home if there was a report of discrimination or there was a report of some other sort of wrongdoing or, or, or something happening. So that kind of jury is still out. I'm not sure how to weave that story quite as much. But the third arm are these interviews I'm doing with people all over the country. So these are in-depth interviews. They take about an hour-ish where I'm talking with folks. Some are funeral directors. Some are, I've, I just interviewed a um, embalmer. So I, I've got a couple of death educators. I've got a lot of different folks in the LGBTQ community who have lent their voice to this part of the study where I'm trying to really look at barriers to this equity and inclusion and um, also the solutions. What can we do to collaborate as both citizens and consumers of death care services and providers to really create safe spaces in our funeral homes and, and, and other death care you know, services so that LGBTQIA folks can say, oh, hey, that's a place I can go. I can pre-plan. I can tell them I'm trans. I can be who I am and not worry. So so the, the end game here for me is to somehow bring consumers and providers together in a way that benefits everyone. And also, um, I have a grand <laughs> plan, <laughs> which which will take money. So we'll see <laughs> how, how it works to, to create sort of like a database, if you will, or a website where an LGBTQ person could go and find friendly, inclusive providers who have kind of raised their hand and said, hey, I'm safe. You can come to me and and I want to honor you who you are and provide you with services that align with your life story. So that's that's the that's the whole shebang. That is something that I'm personally fascinated with. An awful joke that I'm going to just go ahead and say on, on the podcast is I happen to be a Mets fan. And during Pride Month, Citibank turns their rainbow, rainbow colored from non-rainbow colored. And on one level, it's it feels a little gross, right? On, on one level, it's like almost like they feel like they have to. But on the other level, it feels good that they feel like they have to. And making people say or, or encouraging people to say, yes, I do accept people. It has a power of almost kind of like a fake it till you make it kind of power where you say it often enough, then you actually do it as well. Do you, do you, does that, does that ring true at all? I think one thing for me is that gay rights, trans rights, queer rights are rights seven days a week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So although it is a start for companies and industries and providers to support pride festivals and to throw up the flags in June, and there are many flags now, <laughs> Um, it's something that we need a permanent presence. Everybody dies. <laughs> Everybody dies sooner or later. It's the one thing we can all bank on. And the one thing we all have in common is that we're going to die. So to have a constant presence of support, to have someone willing to step up and say, I'm going to put this pride flag on my website, not just put it out in front of the funeral home, Right. During June or whenever their local community celebrates Pride, <laughs> celebrates Pride, because ours here actually does in September. For me, that's that's the long term vision is for some champions in the death care space. And there are many, you know, I've, I've talked to many who have said during our interviews, you know what, I'm going to change my website. I want to do better. I want to to be that signal. I want to be that light in the darkness, you know, where folks are scanning for their safe providers. 
So although I do think it's a start to um, have providers, you know, maybe either step outside their comfort comfort zone or be more explicit about their support during Pride or, or during key times for the LGBTQ community, I also would really love to see these champions kind of set a precedent and say, we're going to emblazon something and we're going to change our forms and not just say male, female. We're going to do, we're going to go that extra step and make sure that, you know, we are critically evaluating our services through the lens of being LGBTQ. And I think that's kind of where things will really start to shift. We actually also mentioned this in our in our last conversation about death certificates and filling them out in a way that honors the person's identity and how that can be tricky for some funeral homes. Some funeral homes may feel like that's a that's a tricky proposition. Some states may make it difficult to do that. You know, so you've got same-sex relationships now are federally legal. We have jumped that hurdle. Um, thank you to Jim Obergefell <laughs> for, <laughs> and others and many, many others for paving the way for same-sex marriage and folks to be uh, on, on each other's death certificates. Um, however, for um, you know, trans, queer, and non-binary folks, that does get tricky because the information that goes into a death certificate comes from various places. It comes from documentation that you carry with you your whole life, right? From your birth certificate to your driver's license, to your state ID, to your passport, you know, whatever mm-hmm. documents you have had made with your name, with your, you know, your gender identity and the hoops to jump through to get those documents done are often the barriers that are put in place of medical examiners, coroners, and funeral directors who are handling these death certificates and death documents. Even if you have a funeral director or, you know, a medical examiner, someone who has absolute best intentions of putting the gender identity of the person, you know, how they identify on their death certificate for the the trans, non-binary, and queer community, they will have had to jump through all of those hoops and get all those documents lined up so that their death certificate can be properly completed. So it's sort of a multi-systemic system barrier. And you're absolutely right. All states are different. (laughs) You know, California um, recently has made some changes that have started to kind of lead the way. Um, You and I discussed an article that came out from Oregon where, you know, a study sort of highlighted some of these inconsistencies in the ways that we need to make change. And so, you know, you know, it's it's easy for funeral providers or medical examiners or coroners who don't want to honor the person to not honor them if the documents aren't in order. It's a barrier sort of either way. So folks on the LGBTQ side are going to have to do their due diligence and their paperwork and unfortunately get through those barriers and jump through those hoops to get their documents ready. And if they are and, you know, they die, that makes it easier for a person filling out the death certificate to do it properly for them. Um, I think the other tricky thing is that when you have families who are, you know, in argument with with their loved one about their gender identity, you know, certainly they can get into the ear of a funeral director or other person who is filling out that documentation, and that can be a real pressure on them as well, and that that becomes a difficult situation. So there's a lot of things to think about. We're going to take a little break now because I want to introduce you to Lucia Iani. She is our new marketing director here at Kate Spoilston, and she's going to talk to us about an upcoming event, Revenue Generation. So so welcome, Lucia. Welcome to the company. Welcome to the uh, FSI, the podcast. Thanks, Tony. I'm excited to be here. I'm happy to talk to you about Revenue Generation. This is a brand new event for Kate Spoilston. It's happening on June 7th and 8th. It's a two-day event. It's a virtual event. It'll be two hours each day from 1 to 3 p.m. And there will be four guest speakers teaching you new ways to generate income for your business. Some of those ways are just different add-ons to things that you're already doing rather than brand new things that you have to start. Correct. How to use what you have and grow your business. Just go to our website and under the events section, you will see a tab to register. And if you missed the event, you can always access it on our on-demand section of our website. This event and all of our virtual events and webinars are always free. Fantastic. And all of that information is in the show notes. You've been doing more social media now, so we're really kind of worth following on all Absolutely. Of the podcasts, right? Yes. Please follow us on all our social media channels. Thanks for joining me. And now we're going to get back to the show. 
the other thing that I wanted to touch on while we still had a little bit of time is one of the things you said about your research is that you got some surprising results that didn't break down along urban, rural, and suburban demographics the way that you thought they might. Yeah. You know, I I think going into any study, when you're talking about LGBTQ populations, you think about where people gather and where people feel safe. And in urban areas, you see, you know, whole neighborhoods that have pride flags that have, you know, sort of a concentration, if you will, of LGBTQ folks. And then in rural areas, you, you don't see that quite as much. So I sort of went into this study thinking, oh, gosh, I'm going to talk to folks who work in urban areas and they're going to be really savvy and they're going to have all kinds of, you know, ideas about solutions. And I'm going to talk to rural folks and they may still be kind of scratching their heads and they may not be quite as, you know, progressive in their thinking about how to resolve some of these barriers. And I was really surprised. I really got a mixture of of ideas, you know, barriers and solutions from both rural and urban folks. What it boils down to, quite frankly, is the differences tend to be more in some of these sort of isolated family owned funeral homes. And you can find those in urban or suburban or rural areas versus, you know, you've got some Uh, family owned funeral homes that are owned by younger generations because they've been passed down and the younger generations have stayed in. And with each new generation, we're starting to see some progress made toward equality and equity. I really went into this thinking I would see much more distinct differences than I do between, you know, rural and, and urban areas. But I should have shifted my thinking. And I and I think it it is shifting. It's evolving. You know, the results of my initial website study told me that it really doesn't matter if you're urban or rural, because, you know, if you're urban, you would have a lot of, you know, sort of explicit signaling if that theory held true. Mm. Um, but but I didn't. So, you know, I should have maybe shifted my thinking. Either way, though, the interviews are very open-ended in that people from wherever they come from, whether it's rural Pennsylvania or, you know, urban Chicago, I I really leave it open to explore things in a very, you know, sort of neutral way where the phenomenon lays itself out regardless of of their environment. But it has been really, it has been really eye-opening. Were there any specific surprises that came, that have come out of your interviews? Um. Yes, I would say that some of the the biggest surprises is I've met with a number of gay and lesbian funeral home owners. So um, when you're an owner, you may have other owners with you or you may be a singular owner. And they, you know, when I ask them about the findings of my website study and what their response to that is, they sort of blush and say, you know, I, I'm part of the problem. <laughs> you know, my own website does not signal, hey, and, and I tell you what, here's, here's the thing. Folks are really relying on word of mouth. This is a consistent finding. And I'll tell you why that surprises me. Death care is not a restaurant. You know, it's okay to find a restaurant through word of mouth and say, okay, that place will not, you know, treat you poorly if you're in the LGBT community. In fact, they'll treat you awesome. Or in fact, they're owned by a gay couple or what have you. But when you're trying to find a funeral home and this is your lasting memory, your last moment to say, this is me, this is how I'm showing myself off out of this world, word of mouth you know, you might find a friendly funeral home that way, but it becomes increasingly difficult when you have 18,000 funeral homes in the United States. And uh, especially if you do live in a rural area where you don't have a lot of choices, trying to find a place that is going to serve you in the way you, you should be served would be very difficult. So, you know, it, it was really interesting and surprising to me that some of my rural gay owners of funeral homes we're not doing more or something different. Now, in our conversation, they all said, yeah, you know, <laughs> I want to make that change. Like, this is this is an important conversation. Um, and, and I want my LGBTQ community to know that I'm not just here for those who already know me and know that I'm gay and know that I own a funeral home. I want to be there for people who might move into my community and they don't know me and they don't know who to talk to. So that it's a surprise, but was also a very great conversation to have to raise awareness, even within the community. Well, one of the things that I write about 
pretty much every week is funeral homes are also not notorious are, are notorious for not necessarily keeping up their website in in general <laughs> you know it's uh, i look at i look at funeral homes from all over the country and it's shocking how many of them still have the same template they don't have the same template as someone in town but they do have the same te- the same template as someone outside of town it's one of the it's one of the other issues that i know that uh, many of the smaller ones struggle with is just you know taking their website and making it their own personal one way or the other so i wonder how much that has to uh how, how much that has to bear on it oh gosh if i had to just throw out a number i'd say 80 to 85% of the website that i looked at um cuz i looked at probably 500 but i really only included 100 in my study mm. um <laughs> they, they they're all templated um in fact there seem to be two major um, <laughs> website providers for for the death care industry specifically funeral homes and i get it like you are running this business that you, you know you might be leaving at two in the morning to go to go pick somebody up you know i mean you you're very busy your infrastructure is small sometimes you're stretched thin but you don't have to do it yourself, right? You can tell somebody what you want on your website and they'll do it for you. And so I get that websites are sometimes not top of the list. They're not the priority, but that is how people find you these days. You know, like my 85 year old, you know, grandfather, well, not my grandfather, but someone's 85 year old grandfather may not find a funeral home that way. He may use the same funeral home his family's always used, but we are in 2023 and this is how people find our services. And this is how younger people who are burying their parents are going to find your services. One of the interviews I did is with the daughter of two fathers, you know, and she called me out and I was glad she did. She's like, Jennifer, we're not just talking about people who, you know, are dying or who are seeking services for themselves. We're talking about the kids of people who are dying and seeking services for their parents or their loved ones. And she's like, we're the ones who are finding these services too, if not more so. And I said, you're absolutely right. I said, when we're thinking big picture here about how people find services, especially when you are in a marginalized community and you're afraid of being discriminated against, you are not going to walk in to the front door and say, oh, hey, are you a safe space for me? Right. You're going to look for it behind the scenes where you feel protected. So you're going to get on your computer and you're going to say, okay, I want, as a trans person, I want to find out if I can find, or I want to find a safe space for my funeral. I want to find a safe provider who will listen to me and and honor my gender identity because maybe my family doesn't. And I want to do it now because if I don't do it now, they might, what's called dead name me, right? They may give the funeral provider the wrong name, the wrong gender, the wrong information about me. And I don't want that to happen. So I want to pre-plan, but I want to pre-plan in a safe space. That is why it's so important to start thinking about making your website a place, you know, where people can see your front door and see that it's a safe place to come. Excellent. And That kind of brings us to the end. I did want to ask whether you're still looking for interviewees, whether we should suggest that people try to reach out to you. How close are you to the end of your study? And, you know, is this something that's going to be just published in um, in in a journal or is this something that the rest of us will get to see? Yeah, I mean, those are all great questions. First of all, yes, I'm still taking interviews. And I will probably be still taking interviews um, until the end of May, beginning of June. And I'm, I'm even willing to sort of go into June a little bit if that's easier for folks with their schedules, because I do know how busy folks are. I really do. So I'm still, I'm still doing interviews. I would love to hear people's voices. And I also want to say, you know, if there is someone out there in the death care industry, in the death care space who says, I would like to, for my voice to be heard about this issue the, and, and I'm not in the LGBTQ community, I want to hear from you too. So, you know, I really want to hear a range of voices here um, because everybody has ideas and thoughts. Everybody has experiences and, and life stories that teach us more about, about you know, what's out there. So, so I want to hear from folks. They do get a $40 gift card for their time. It's uh, Amazon, so I can kind of buy you anything these days, right? Um, and... Um, Gosh, what was your other question, Tony? Oh, how 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 long till we see this this final oh, yeah. report? And what's it? Yeah. So the paper from the website study, as you know, is already published. 
I do have some permissions left on that. So if folks want a copy, I'm, I, I should be able to send them a copy. I, I did. I have a policy paper manuscript, but that's still in development. I'm still having sort of some conversations about that. And then the interviews, the way it typically works in academia is that um, once my interviews are all done, then I go into data analysis and that takes some months. So it's going to be 2024, end of 2023, you know, beginning of 2024 before that paper is out probably. Um, but I don't anticipate it just being something you can find in academia. I do plan on trying to create some additional avenues to get this information out. I do have a blog on my website where I write about these issues. And, you know, they're, they're, stay tuned because there will be some other places where, where you'll see me sharing my findings with folks. Fantastic. And what is your website address if people want to? Well, it's super easy. It's just my name.com. So <laughs> Jennifer Wright Berryman.com. So uh, the Wright Berryman is W R I G H T B E R R Y M A N. So Excellent. Jennifer Wright Berryman.com. Yep. And thank you so much for your time. And, Thank you. Um, we'll uh, we'll talk. I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Hopefully not in June. I'm, my, that's that's my 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 policy is I'm trying to avoid doing things like this in June. I I, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Oh, one last thing, real quick, mm-hmm. if you don't mind. No. I am I am planning and trying to get to NFDA this year, so I'm hoping to meet folks there. So anyone listening to your podcast who might be there and wants to have an additional conversation. I'm hoping to be there and, and network and really uh, uh, continue my learning. Excellent. And that's in Las Vegas. Las I Vegas think, in, in September. September. Yep. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I've already said it, but I'll say it again. Make sure you check out the show notes because that's where you can get in touch with us. And that is where you can find more information about Jennifer Wright Berryman and her research. If you have any feedback that you'd like to leave, you can send me an email, and my email address is a russo at k like kite, b like boy publications.com. You can also call and leave me a voicemail at 732 746 0201. And you can do both if you'd like. You can record a message on your phone and email it to me at the address I mentioned. I'll play the ones that are appropriate and we can continue to have this conversation. Funeral Service Insider, the podcast, is a Kate Spoilston Productions. It was written and edited by me, Tony Russo. I always say subscribe where you're listening now, and please do. If you're listening on the website and you can't see a place to subscribe, just follow the link and there's a button to click to follow, and then it'll show you we're available on Spotify, we're available on Apple Music, And we are available on Amazon, pretty much any place you get podcasts. For this week's postmortem, I want to tell you a quick story about putting the magazine together. So one of the things that I do is I help put together American Funeral Director, which is a magazine I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And in this episode, in this episode, in this, and in this edition, and in the June 2023 edition of And in the June 2023 issue of American Funeral Director, there's a story that's profiling Alan Creedy, who is a director of note, and he's talking about some of the consulting work he did. And he goes off, not not quite on a tangent, but he makes a really specific point of telling funeral directors to pay their taxes before they try and sell their businesses. Uh, He implies that maybe funeral directors aren't always as forthcoming as they should be on their tax returns. And I thought it was a weird thing to take the time to say until I saw the news this week. And I would like to read to you from the reporting. Jackson, Mississippi funeral director and state representative Earl Banks pled guilty to making false statements on his tax return after claiming a 2018 adjusted gross income of $38,237. That same year, he earned more than $500,000 from the sale of real estate, according to Mississippi Today. The story ends with the assurance that banks can still run for office since violating federal tax law is one of the few crimes you can commit without being banned from serving in the Mississippi legislature. I just, it was so coincidental and I hadn't ever thought about the tax implications of being dodgy when you're getting ready to sell your 
funeral home. So if I can echo Mr. Creedy, pay your taxes. Make sure you join us next week when we speak with Tony Cumming, who is the new president of Pinnacle Funeral Services and, of course, recent president of Newbridge. Um, He's going to talk to us about acquisitions and about sales and about his vision for the company going forward. And one more time, please remember, subscribe wherever you're listening now. All right. Well, that does it for this week on Funeral Service Insider, the podcast.